thank you again uh, for the invitation. It's very kind of you to give up your lunch hour. Uh, this will be a, a, a kind of picture show, so um, no real deep mathematics. What's there? Uh, there will be some equations, um, but mostly just for, for sort of uh, context rather than looking at the, the fine details. What this project really, what would this, um, what, what I'll present today really covers my uh, activities, my connections with uh, colleagues in life sciences here at the University of Dundee, where we've been looking at the architecture of biofilms. And I'll explain a bit more about biofilms and, and the, what in particular the architecture we're interested in. Just to say that Dundee's an absolutely gorgeous city. Back to you, is here with us for many years and I'm sure he can, uh, he can uh, confirm that beautiful city on, on the river this is just a snapshot of us looking at Dundee from across the water. It is a gorgeous city if you ever get an opportunity to visit. Many, many things going on. Um, so I do encourage anybody who's keen on a visit up north to come and visit us. Okay, so this is a brief overview of what I'm talk uh, I'll cover today. Um, I'm not sure how far I'll get through, so uh, I'll, I'll possibly stop short if, if we're running out of time, but I'll give a brief introduction to biofilms. Now, so what is a bacterial biofilm? Well, this picture on the left here, this is a bacterial biofilm within a Petri dish, so this is about two and a half centimetres across, and, and this is a bacterial biofilm. This is in the Yellowstone National Park in America. This is a, this yellowy orange thing around here is a bacterial biofilm, and this is hundreds of metres across, so um, vastly different scales, uh, but both bacterial biofilms. I'll then talk a, a little bit about the kind of modelling approaches that we've taken and, and uh, point to some some uh, key uh, reviews which I, I think are, are important and then moving on through to some further thoughts where we're, we hope to be getting to um, in the future and, and if I've got time I'll show you some some movies which really just are there to promote thinking promote uh, ideas rather than uh, solutions or answers to anything. Okay so um, first off I'll get in my acknowledgements first in case I run out of time all, all, all of this work, uh, almost all of this work has been done in collaboration with uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Dr. Nick, uh, Professor Nicholas Stanley Wall, who's Professor of uh, Molecular Microbiology in the University of Dundee. And uh, Nicholas has a large experimental group, and we have worked closely together, gosh, for, for probably 10 to 15 years now. Um, Currently, we, we are funded by the BBSRC through what's called an SEOLA. Um, so these are large grants. And uh, the, the, the folks with the stars against their name are, are currently employed on, on that grant. And I'd just like to highlight the two at the bottom here. So um, Daniel and Lucas are two uh, maths postdocs that we've had. Daniel has now moved on and, and Lucas has moved in. And I'll, I will get onto their work later on. Okay, so bacterial biofilms, really, sorry, this is a mathematician's introduction, so I do apologize to anybody who, who is a microbiologist in the audience. Uh, certainly when I, you know, when I started this uh, adventure and, and thought about bacteria, I think I had this view of, of bacteria being these little rod-shaped individual uh, organisms, free swimming and so on, uh, as, if, you know, as in this uh, picture here where in fact that view is almost entirely wrong. Almost all bacteria, in fact, almost all microbes on the planet live within biofilms. Now a biofilm is a uh, millions of, of, of individual cells which are encased within a self-produced glue of extracellular polymeric matrix, as it's called technically. So the matrix is produced by the cells themselves. They stick together and they form this community called a biofilm. And here, it is a picture of, of a lab-grown biofilm. So much, most of what you see here in this brown wrinkly structure is in fact this extracellular polymeric matrix. It's the, the glue that sticks the cells together rather than you're seeing the individual cells. Now this is absolutely key to my antimicrobial resistance, the formation of these biofilms. Um, the reason why, why it is so hard to get rid of, for example, uh, infections within deep wounds, infections in, uh, for example, joint replacements or in or implants, medical implants, is, is um, there are multiple problems, but one of the problems is that the, the bugs themselves are in fact encased in a biofilm and it just makes it physically hard for the, the antimicrobial agent, the drug, the antibiotic, to get into the biofilm and, and kill the cells. And that's why um, biofilms are, are understanding biofilms is key to, to better understanding uh, infections 
better understanding how we could make more efficient use of our current antibiotics. Biofilms really are everywhere, pluses and minuses. I've got some, uh, the, the sort of usual gratuitous, gratuitous pictures down here. Um, eye infections, plaque you know, in your teeth is a, the bacterial biofilm. Um, without bacterial biofilms, we would not be able to operate as, as, as a human organism. In fact, we have more microbial cells within our human body than, than, than human cells. And, and those microbes populate our gut and they help us uh, digest our food and, and process the nutrients. Um, biofilms have, uh, have a range of, of biotechnological um, applications. Sewage treatment, for example, is one. So, so a real uh, mix of human life and, and the life of biofilms are inextricably linked. The biofilms that we're interested in uh, are formed by a species called Bacillus subtilis. Now, there's nothing particularly unique about these species. They're soil-dwelling species, so they live in the soil. Um, they have antifungal properties, which means that they are used as a plant uh, growth promoter. So they're, in fact, applied in an agricultural setting to help to promote crop growth. They're what's called a gram-positive um, organism, so they, they're, their cell wall and, and, and outer membranes are in a certain structure. Um, and there are what's called a model lab organism. That is, there's a great deal known about the, these microbes, and therefore uh, our colleagues in, in, in microbiology know precisely the gene makeup and so on, so they can control the behavior of these biofilms genetically uh, very, very carefully. As I mentioned um, before, bacterial biofilms are very important to industrial settings, and in fact, bacillus is a, is a really important um, uh, a workhorse of industry, really important for industry. It produces, for example, the enzymes in our washing powder, um, but also many, many other bio bio biotechnological applications. And one, in fact, can find um, many, many products. If you, if you just uh, search for um, Bacillus subtilis on Amazon, I think you come up to 27 different products that you can buy on Amazon, from uh, food additives through to uh, yeah, plant growth promoting uh, additives. Uh, where it's, uh, I guess, it's slightly darker side comes in is that it's a close relative of Bacillus anthracis. And so that's the, the bacterium that produces the anthrax spore, uh, that infamous um, biological war agent that was developed through the, or discovered in the Second World War. Now, how the biofilms are grown in our um, labs is uh, what's called the colony biofilm model. So what this is, is a petri dish, a round dish about um, six centimeters or so across, nine centimeters across. It is very shallow, it's about a centimeter deep. And into that is poured agar, which is a jelly-like substance which contains the required nutrients for growth. Then the biofilm is inoculated on top. So it's pipetted on top in a little droplet with containing um, anything between one and, 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 and a few thousand cells. And then the biofilm grows out across the surface of, of the agar, absorbing the nutrients from below. The biofilm formation is an incredibly complex spatiotemporal process. And perhaps now you begin to see where, where mathematicians might get interested in this. Incredibly complex. So here in the top left picture here, uh, we see the early stages of biofilm formation. Now, you, 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 you're right if you think these, these don't look like individual cells, they look like strings of spaghetti, because that's exactly what's happening. On the right of the picture here, you can just see individual cells dividing. So these cells divide, um, they, they, they divide asexually, they just you know, double their DNA, double their size, and then split into two. However, in the biofilm setting, a, a genetic switch is, is flicked, and these cells, in fact, don't separate completely. They divide internally, but they remain connected on the outside, forming these amazingly complex spaghetti-like structures. This process then continues and develops, becoming incredibly rich in its, its, in its complexity until you get these mature biofilm structures, which are about um, a couple of centimeters across. So we're going from a single cell, which is a, a few microns long, up to structures which are um, centimeters across. So vast range of scales in the production of these, um, these biofilms. And if one cuts through these biofilm in a kind of vertical section and, and then stain the gene for gene activity, then what we see is that even within this, this, this population at its mature stage, 
what we have is different groups of cells in different locations of the biofilm doing different jobs. So although each one of these cells within this community is a genetic, uh, a, a, a genetically identical to the first cell, so these are just clones of each other, they have in fact differentiated so that rather than thinking of this as just being a genetic multiple uh, cell community, what we can think about it is as a genuine multicellular differentiated uh, single organism. So a bacterial biofilm, I think, is it's much um, more clear to, or much um, better to think about it as a uh, as a differentiated multicellular organism than just a, a collection of individual cells. So much more similar, in fact, to you know multicellular organisms like ourselves uh, than than just a collection of individuals. Uh, as I mentioned, the structure develops over time. And what we see is that at the initial inoculation stage, and you perhaps just see the water droplet, the little initial water droplet there, and then it gets cloudy as more and more cells are produced and divide. And it's not until much later that the structure begins to develop. And there's a clear difference in structure as well. And in fact, this, this sort of dividing circle, if you like, between the outside radial um, structures and the internal tortuous structures is almost exactly where that the original edge of the uh, droplet of water was. This is called the coffee ring effect. And it's essentially just due to a higher cell density um, forming at this, this, this edge. Structure also depends on the environment. And in fact, we, do, we, we did some simple experiments in the lab where we just grew this exactly the same biofilm, but on agars, on jellies that were just um, more and more loose, but contained more and more water, so more and more slippy. And in what you can see is that from, from quite dense media, and biofilms grow in quite dense media, what you get is uh, very wrinkled structures. And as if you decrease the media density, that gets to less and less wrinkled structures until you get right down to possibly you know, the extreme case, the, the, the asymptotic cases, where if you grow a biofilm on a surf, surface of water um, or, or, or liquid solution, then you get what's called a pellicle, and that, that's, but it's almost completely flat. flat. One can also control the structure genetically. Uh, this is what, what, what we would call the wild type structure. Now, wild type just means it's the organism that you would view as your baseline, your kind of datum level organism. And then you can change the genetic components of this datum, this, this baseline organism, and you can make the structure greater, more wrinkled, or indeed you can reduce the structure to almost zero. So you can genetically control the stru structure. So the structure is developed over time, it depends on the environment and it can be genetically controlled. So the question really, oh, I beg your pardon. So the question really that we are trying to, to address is how do we you know, encapsulate all that information? So we've got individual cells at the micron stage going through this kind of bizarre spaghetti-like structure through to these centimeter scale objects, and indeed, uh, you know, uh, even up to these uh, tens of meter scales. Uh, objects, as, we, as I mentioned at the beginning there at Yellowstone National Park. And this is, I guess, is where mathematical modelling comes in. And, and what we've been attempting to do is attempt to bridge those scales using mathematical modelling. Very, very difficult to think how one would do an experiment that would which, which bridge all those scales. So we're attempting to, to help in, in discovering how the different scales interconnect with each other using maths modelling. Um, so the idea is to is essentially to pass up the scales and then pass down the scales because as as I mentioned before, clearly in these large scale structures we're seeing gene differentiation, and therefore the the, the positioning, the structure, the physical scale of these objects uh, is determining the gene readout. That is, it's forcing the cells to produce one set of proteins as opposed to another. Uh, and therefore one has to connect back to the, the DNA of an individual cell to work out why it's being triggered to do so. And so there's this kind of virtuous cycle across the scales. We've principally been focused in, and I guess at the small scale and at the big scale, that these meso scales are always challenging, aren't they? So the small scale, we're interested in gene regulatory networks. So these are really trying to understand the nuts and bolts of the genetic controls within individual cells. And 
This invariably involves using an ordinary differential equation approach and, and stochastic simulations. And uh, we've been working on this for some, for some, some time, we've post for a while, Xiong Yi produced a nice paper in 2012, long time ago now. Um, but that's uh, been taken on. And, and in fact, my, my current student, one of my current students, Yamin, has is, is taken up that uh, mantle. Now he's taken on the baton. So he's working, he's got, doing some nice work in his PhD on, on genetic control of um, bacterial biofilms and the, the various motifs that underlie those, um, those genetic control networks, these gene regulatory networks. At the large scale stage, um, we've been principally trying to better understand these structures that you see in the picture in the top right here, these wrinkles, these folds, uh, how, how, how do they come about? What is it that, about these biofilms that, that make these wrinkles and folds, because they're apparent not only in Bacillus subtilis biofilms, but, but in many, many species of bacteria and in, in many species of microbes, when it gets biofilms with these, um, with these kind of wrinkled structures, even in, in things like yeast biofilms. So, so they're a common property of, of multicellular biofilms. And I've uh, worked with uh, PhD students Lao Shen Li and Heather Wallace on this. They did some nice work in their thesis and that's currently been done, uh, taken on by well, another one of my students, Mansur, who's, who's looking at how quorum sensing affects uh, pattern formation within uh, communities of, bio, of bacteria. These large scale structures has been the, uh, has formed the attention of, of many, many groups across the world for, for many, many years, decades, really. And um, much of the approach has been a reaction diffusion equation, so um, PDE approach. Um, this is a super review. Uh, anybody who's in the in the business probably knows the review of Clapper and Dockery way back in 2010, and I think that, that really sets up the standard in reviews. Great review up to that point in time. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to to Lao Shen and Heather. I, I think they produced nice theses where they've they've done a really nice um, literature review uh, of of pattern formation up to the kind of 2015-2016. Uh, um, stage and, and in fact Heather and, and Lao Shen uh, co-authored a paper which appeared in um, Mathematical Modeling and Natural Phenomena in 2016 which again contains a, 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 an abridged review. More recent reviews, uh, I've just picked a couple and, and again you know, folks will, will find that the reviews are plentiful but these are just two which I thought I would highlight because for anybody who's interested in getting into this area or, or at least finding out a little bit more I think these two are really cracking reviews. Um, so Matty et al. in 2018, so that, that really gives a, a, an overarching review of, of both um, deterministic and, and uh, individual based models. Um, that's in the Esposito group, from the Esposito group in um, Italy in um, Nice, I think he's in. Uh, and most recently, um, Paulina uh, Gianach. Um, so uh, Paulina just recently completed her PhD in Curtin University. It was in fact a joint PhD between Curtin University and Aberdeen University in Scotland. So antipodal uh, PhD. Um, and she wrote a really cracking review, which has appeared in Royal Society Interface. And it's, it's, it's set out in a really clear way. She's tabulated the different techniques that, that, that are applied in different uh, in situations. So again, I encourage anybody to, to look up that review. Very, you, you'll have the recording of this, but I'm very happy to send uh, anybody who's interested in the details uh, of these. But let's just talk a little bit about what, what Heather did for, for, for a few slides. Um, and this will contain some mathematics. As I, as I said, it, it's really just there for um, to, to set the framework. Uh, as I said, most of my work has been done using um, differential equations and partial differential equations. So, so differential equations is the thread that runs through all of, all of my work. And what Heather was really interested in was the, the wrinkles. So if you, if you kind of look at the biofilm and, and particularly you concentrate on this inner ring here. So remember this white ring that I've, I've uh, indicated on the picture is pretty much the extent of the initial inoculum. So when you put your droplet down, your little droplet settles on the top of the agar and this white ring kind of marks the edge of that, that droplet. And um, that then forms a, a kind of ridge of, of cells due to um, uh, higher density of cells being, being um, deposited on the agar surface at the edge. 
and that forms a barrier and then within that barrier you get this wonderful structure and uh, Heather was really interested in how the structure forms. So we were really interested in, in it from that large scale level. So rather than thinking about it as being an individual based model and thinking about individual cells and billions of cells combining together to form the structure, we thought of, of, of it as the biofilm as a, as a, as a kind of, you know, a, a continuum level. So we were thinking about, we know that biofilms have elastic properties. We know that this, that agar has viscoelastic properties. These are well documented and being reported. It is known that the, the, the biofilm and the agar interact. So it, the biofilm leaves uh, what's called a footprint in the agar. That is, if you peeled off the biofilm, you would in fact see these wrinkled structures embedded in the, bio, in the, in the agar. So all of that buckling doesn't, all, doesn't just happen up the way, it is also happening down into the agar. And so uh, as, a, as a first approach, um, Heather was interested in thinking about this as, as a bilayer, as, a, as a, an elastic and a viscoelastic bilayer. And I've just put a wee star here to don't overthink the, the circular symmetry here, really just think about the structure that, which is within the center. So I drew a square there in the center, just kind of forget about everything else that's outside and just think about these, this wonderfully complex tortuous structure that you see in the center. So viscoelastic bilayer, um, that was the thinking. And where we took our mathematical inspiration was, was from these couple of papers, cracking papers by Im and Huang, uh, and then later in Huang, and, and this is really where all the details lie. So I encourage folks to, to, to um, either read um, Heather's thesis or uh, it, where the original source of this material is, in, is given in these papers here. So the idea really is that we have a rigid surface and then we have a viscoelastic layer, which is thin, and then we have a very thin elastic layer, which lies on top. I, I think the best way to think about this is that then there's a growth process by which the biofilm grows out. Now, if you remember from those, those images that I showed you earlier, the biofilm has no structure to start with, and then the structure forms as it matures. So it grows out, and then the structure forms. So the best way I think one can think about it is, is taking an elastic layer, growing it, stretching it, as it were, and, it, and sticking it to the elastic, the viscoelastic sublayer, and then letting go. And imagine what happens when that wrinkling, when that the elastic, uh, the, the, the elastic layer tries to relax back, and how does it inter interact with that viscoelastic layer in which it's connected? So you can imagine as it's trying to relax back, it, it buckles. Okay, so that that's really the, the kind of fundamentals behind it. The mathematics behind it is um, what what are called uh, the. You, one can split into two parts. So for the elastic layer, you can apply what's called the Foppel von Karman equations. Uh, now, now folks will either know these or, or they won't. Um, so they're, what they are is the standard plate bending equation. So you take a, a, an elastic plate and you bend it. And what the Foppel von Karman equation does is it says, imagine I have a very thin plate and instead of just bending it slightly, I actually allow the, bend, the, the, the buckles and, 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 and the twists to be quite significant. And so what it does is it takes the standard plate bending equation, if you like, um, so where W is the, is the uh, direction in which the plate bends, so the, 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 the Z direction, displacement out of the plane, and you add on a nonlinear component, which takes account of these large scale deflections. The stress strain relationship is, is uh, a kind of standard Hooke's law, but the strain again has a non-linear component that takes account of these, these large scale deflections. So uh, again, details in, in, in Heather's um, thesis or in, or in the original papers here. For the viscoelastic layer, again, um, folks will either know the details or not. Essentially what, what we do is we treat uh, the viscoelastic layer as a thin, layer or which can which is can be modeled by what are called kelvin voigt elements so a kelvin voigt element is really a viscoelastic substance which you can model as a uh, spring and a dashpot in parallel and really again using a lot of approximations in particular and making some uh, approximations about how thin this capital h is how thin the viscoelastic layer is you can work out uh, 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 an equation which tells you how 
uh, movements in in-plane movements in that viscoelastic layer are driven by the top layer, by that, that elastic biofilm layer relaxing on top. So we're driving it by a shear stress in the top, but then it's also, it's a viscous material and therefore it's relaxing under viscous relaxation. Putting those all together, we have our equations which govern the uh, elastic viscoelastic bilayer. So we're relating our viscous uh, damping, as it were, and driving via the, 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 the top surface uh, relaxing. And then we're, we are measuring the outer plane displacement in the, the surface here, in this thin layer here. So we're measuring buckling in this direction, and then we're measuring the kind of buckling in this direction. And to cut a very, very long story short, um, Heather then took those equations. She, she uh, solved them numerically. She solved them using MATLAB. She used, used COMSOL program. And using biologically relevant parameter values for things like the, um, let, let me just point out some, some key parameter values, things like the, 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 uh, the Poisson ratio of the, of, the, of the elastic layer, so that is how much it, it compresses in one direction when you stretch it in another, using the viscous damping coefficients and so on. So using these biologically, uh, using biologically relevant values for these important physical parameters, then Heather was able to recapture the kind of structure that you would see in the experiment. However, the scale was, was an order of magnitude wrong. So what the model was predicting was that I could get the correct structure, we could get the correct shape, but the only way to do that was to have a scale that was, it was an order of magnitude wrong. So biologically relevant parameters led to the right pattern formation process, but the wrong scale. And we thought about this for some time. Uh, um, there was a number of, of, of possibilities that we could consider uh, we thought about, for example, the, not all of the agar being, being a viscoelastic layer, but perhaps just a little bit of the agar at the top being a viscoelastic layer and so on. But, but nothing really seemed to present the correct pattern and the correct scale, apart from the last case that we considered, which was to think not about the agar and the biofilm being a viscoelastic elastic by there, but rather the biofilm itself being a having a viscoelastic core uh, and an elastic layer which lay on top. So if we then consider the agar to be essentially rigid and the biofilm itself, now I, I forgot to mention, but the biofilm, as I said, uh, I did mention it was a few centimeters across. Uh, it's, it's probably about a millimeter deep. So there, thereabouts. So, but if we uh, imagine that millimeter depth of biofilm to again have a very thin elastic coating and a viscoelastic core, then under those conditions, uh, we are able to um, get the right scale in the right time. Now, what would be the motivation for that? Well, uh, earlier work done on Nicholas lab was in fact that to show that, that biofilms, certainly bacillus biofilms, do exactly have this, this kind of bilayer structure. What they've got is this uh, raincoat, as it's been called, this BSLA uh, structure. So it's proteins which lie on top of the, the biofilm, form on top of the biofilm, which are incredibly hydrophobic. And so they stop water evaporating <clears throat> in and out of the biofilm. And there's no one that these are, that these then are form, form quite an elastic layer. So a combination of, of what we found out in the lab and mathematical modeling led us to, in fact, this uh, parameter values, which treated the biofilm as a bilayer, thinking about this thin elastic layer, potentially being the, the, this, this raincoat, this hydrophobic raincoat with a viscoelastic core, the, the kind of the meat of the biofilm. And this resulted in this correct structure and the right scales. So we were able to recover uh, using parameter values that we got from considering the biofilm as a viscoelastic there, we were able to, to recover the correct structure. And therefore, strongly suggesting that indeed that this is our elastic layer in the biofilm situation. Much more details in Heather's thesis, so please do look that one up. I'm going to return now to this idea of structure developing over time. And uh, I mentioned this, this slide before that we see the structure developing as the biofilm matures. So we see the, the biofilm growing, it grows radially, 
and then the structure develops uh, within the, the, the expanding radius. So with uh, uh, our first postdoc on the, our project, oh, you, we've lost the graph there for, for some reason. I can see the graph, but you guys can't. <laughs> so um, our first project, uh, our first postdoc on, on this S. Lula project, Daniel, Daniel Matos Fernandez, he's now in the Institute for Theoretical Physics in, in Warsaw, um, doing some fantastic work, which I'll mention in a minute. We thought about the simplest problem, and one of the simplest problems to think about is just when watching that biofilm grow out. So the structure, let's just leave the structure for a moment. We'll come back to the structure uh, shortly. So let's just think about the radial expansion of that biofilm. It started in this little disk in the middle, and then it gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and it gets bigger. And if you could see the graph, which I can see on my screen, then what you see is the area of this biofilm grows linearly. So uh, starts at, at something small and grows linearly. The area grows linearly. And then what happens is it begins to tail off. And what we end up with is a, a flat growth arrest. In fact, I'm going to see if I can um, draw this. Let's see if I can draw this. Right, here we go. So. It, oh, it grows linearly, as best as my pen can do, and then, I, and then it tails off. And this is area here, and this is time down here. So what we see is two, two, two interesting things there. One um, is that uh, previously, uh, we, the, the typically been thought that the radius grows linearly with time, and therefore we would expect area to grow um, quadratically. But, but with these biofilms, the, the area grows linearly. And then previously, this growth arrest phase was, is never reported. In fact, you know, we've seen it reported only once or twice in passing. So the question was, why do biofilms stop growing? All of this is juicy agar out here, all a great source of, of food out here. Why does this biofilm grow out and stop? Very, very simple question that it appeared that very few people had, had addressed. Ah, there we go. That's, that's the picture. Well, uh, what our lab, um, what Daniel did in the lab then was he said, well, okay, so my wild site of biofilm stops growing, but I can mutate the biofilm, I can mutate the cells within the biofilm, and I can uh, Get them to keep growing, if you like, and I could do. And Daniel was able to do this with a, with, with a few mutations. It wasn't like a unique mutation; it was a few mutations, but it was mutations in a special pathway. And what the special pathway was um, was in uh, a, a pathway that which produces what's called pulcheraminic acid, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But what we got was this it, this this. Uh, Mutant kept growing, and the biofilm, that was the graph again, I was trying to show you the wild type, would have this linear growth response, and then would stop growing. So what we hypothesized was that, in fact, somehow, um, those biofilms that were the wild type, that were producing this pulcheraminic acid, were it somehow uh, stopping growth. And in fact, there's, there's evidence of this. I don't know if you can pick it up in the slides, but hopefully you can see this slightly brownish layer, slightly brownish halo, as it is called, just surrounding this yellow biofilm here. Now, what this brownish halo is, is in fact chelated iron in the, um, in the underlying substrate. Iron is a key nutrient for growth. Pulcheraminic acid binds to the iron to form a, a, a compound which the, bug, the bacterium the can, cannot absorb. So it just remains fixed in the, in the agar. And so we hypothesized that perhaps this halo of, of chelated iron, this, this iron which is fixed in the agar, cannot be absorbed and used for growth, was in fact somehow impeding the growth of the biofilm itself. So we took a, a reaction diffusion approach to this. We built a very simple model for biofilm density, where we use that what's called a Darcy's law model for, for the biomass, where the velocity of the leading edge 
is proportional to the gra gradient of pressure where pressure is, uh, is generated by growth. We also had a local growth term which was dependent on iron, the iron which was lying in the environment, so lying in the agar. So iron is absorbed into the biofilm, the biofilm uses that to produce growth, cell division, cell division causes an internal pressure which pushes the biofilm edge out. That's the, 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 me the mechanism there. We also included within the model uh, the chemistry by which the biofilm released into the environment this pulcheraminic acid, which diffuses through the agar and fixes the iron. And by a combination of, ma uh, uh, of by, by mathematical modeling, what we're able to show is that in fact, using biologically relevant parameter values, what we could get is that uh, an understanding of the the biofilm grows out, and as it grows out, it produces this pulcheraminic acid. That then, in some sense, produces what, what we call a wave of starvation, which precedes eventually, gets in, it, it catches up with the leading edge, and then it takes over the leading edge of the expanding biofilm. So to start with, the leading edge of the biofilm is winning, getting bigger and bigger, and this, this, this kind of depleted zone, this chelated iron zone is, is behind the leading edge, but then the dynamics of that uh, diffusion of, of, of pulcheraminic acid into the environment means that that wave of starvation eventually overtakes the leading edge of the biofilm and therefore the biofilm has nowhere to go. It is trying to grow into an area where there is no free iron, no, uh, no nutrients for growth, so it eventually just stops. So we wrote this paper, uh, we wrote this, this, this uh, joint um, modeling and experimental paper up in, in PNAS in, in 2019, and the details are there. Uh, we, we hypothesized this, you know, why would it do this? Why, why would a bacterium, why would a biofilm stop itself from growing? And, and is this, you know, perhaps just by accident in some way? But, but we, we actually hypothesized, no, we hypothesized that this is, this is possibly a, a, a kind of growth phase for the biofilm. There's an initial phase, but then there's a sort of entrenchment point where a point where the biofilm thinks, right, uh, I could continue to grow, but I may be attacked and I may be overtaken by other bacteria. And therefore that halo that it builds around itself is like a moat or a protective wall. So it stops itself from growing, but it also stops itself, it stops itself from being invaded by other biofilms and perhaps killed, taken over by other biofilms. So it's a sort of balancing act there that the biofilm goes through, that it, re it reaches the point where it feels it's big enough to be able to reproduce by sporulation or whatever other mechanism, but it also it, it doesn't want to, to be uh, subsequently killed and therefore it builds this sort of protective wall around it. That's, that's, the, that's what we hypothesized anyway. Just returning to the structure, Daniel then went on to, to think more deeply about the structure of biofilms, these wrinkling structures. And I, I really, I'm just going to put this slide up to, to advertise to follow Daniel's work if you're interested in this area. He did some amazing work um, on, on some uh, on active matter. So using some very, very complicated computer simulations to try and model the biofilm structure, not as a viscoelastic bilayer as we did with Heather, that is just these inert subjects, these sub substances, mechanical forces and so on, but rather as an active matter, which is means that there's uh, active agents within the matter. So for example, you include growth and you include remodeling within the um, within the bio, within the viscoelastic layer. So you allow for additional material, you allow for the material to be uh, differentially elastic, differentially viscous, and so on. And so this, uh, I, this area is called active matter, very hot in physics. And what, uh, to cut a really complex story, um, too short, embarrassingly short, what, what Daniel was able to do was to show that in fact, what we got by introducing, by thinking about the biofilm as an active matter rather than just a, uh, an inert elastic or viscoelastic um, sub, um, substance, that one was able to get situations where you could reduce the energy required to generate those, those folds. So essentially what you could do is you could choose the growth rates of your biofilm and if you got them just right, so the biofilm grew uh, fast to start with and then slowed its growth rate, you could in fact form wrinkle structures with, with far less energy requirement than if you just started off with one growth rate and stuck with that. Whether that was either a high rate growth rate or a low growth rate, it didn't matter. Both required more energy than if you, if you just used a, a change in growth rate. 
And so what we, he was able to also show is this idea of convergence, that is that um, you, you could get very similar patterns that, that arose from very different mechanical histories and perhaps suggest why these structures that one sees, these wrinkle structures that one sees are so common that, that it is that it is in some sense there's a convergence to there, that they are, they are that there's an energy consideration there rather than the, the fine details of how they're generated. Uh, Daniel, as I say, is, is now in Warsaw, and he's carrying on this work. He, he also works with a, another colleague of mine, Rasko Skinetnik, here in Dundee, and, and uh, Daniel and Rasko wrote this work up in Physical Review. So I, I, I'm kind of uh, almost there by in the movie, so really this is just where we're moving on to now. And this is work with um, new postdoc, Dr. Lucas uh, Agentler. Lucas, a fantastic young scientist, look out for him. He is absolute star of the future. So uh, Lucas has been working uh, again, using a, a PDE approach, looking at, at, at the kind of more theoretical, e ecological aspects of biofilms. So looking at how biofilms interact with each other, how separate biofilms interact with each other, and indeed how multi-species biofilms uh, interact within themselves. So pictures on the left, these were the, the final, final hurrah of of, of Daniel was really looking at some simple, very simple laboratory experiments where the only difference between this purple biofilm and this green biofilm is its color. These are identical biofilms, but what we see is that if you grow them, um, then clearly uh, there is uh, not only interactions between these biofilms when they touch each other, notice how the structure is quite different at the interaction edge than from uh, at, the, at the, the, the outside edges. But this interaction seems to take place over large scales. So there's, there's clearly an indication that there's very, very complex interactions going on between biofilms. Now, uh, uh, which are initially separated. And, and then in fact, one could even see this within single biofilms where you have what, what are called multi-strain biofilms. This, these sets of pictures are, are single biofilms, single inoculum, but the, um, the, the initial inoculum, initial cells were in sense divided into two, half were colored green, green fluorescent cells, and half were colored purple. So half of the cells would grow up, and if you shone a particular wavelength of light, they would grow green, and half would grow up and they would grow purple. Uh, uh, and one can do experiments where these are identical or whether the green one is um, a strong, competitor and the purple one is a weak competitor and so on and so on. So we could do lots of these, these competitive interaction uh, experiments. And in fact, what Daniel has, uh, what Lucas has been able to do is to use mathematical modeling to better understand some work we've done in the lab recently, which is to grow these multi-strain biofilms where this green, uh, bi uh, green bacterium is a strong competitor and the, the purple bacterium is, is, is a weak competitor. And if you grow these at low founder densities, what you find is that uh, occasionally, at random, you in fact end up with more of the weak competitor than the strong competitor. Now this seemed to sort of uh, you know, be a strange anomaly and a, a, a paradox where, where, where in fact the, the outcome is dominated by the weaker competitor, by the competitor that if you grew the cells together in a flask that you know, the weak one would be killed. And but uh, that Lucas was able to use PDE modeling and, and, and some Monte Carlo uh, simulations to, to, to back up uh, the idea that, that, that really it's at low founder densities, it's not so much who is weak and who is strong, it's a race for space that determines who wins the competitive outcome, the who, who, who essentially dominates the biofilm um, subsequently. And so Daniel, uh, uh, Lucas has been able to, to, to define very precisely a, a metric which says, if I know where my initial cells were, then I can tell you uh, what's the probability that the outcome will be 50-50, that all the greens will dominate, or, or indeed, all the, in fact, we'll get these perverse situations where the weaker strain dominates. That is, that there's more purple area there than green area. At higher founded densities, you get what you expect. The strong competitor wins. So in some sense, there's a, there's a sort of uh, the datum level, the, the, the basic case that we understand, but at low founder densities, what we've been able to uncover is that this, it is not the competitive interaction which dominates um, competitive, final competitive outcome, rather 
it is the access to free space. So I'm just going to finish with a, a couple of, of movies, which I think I'm just going to show here to show you how fascinating the subject is. So this is uh, done by a colleague, Michael Porter, who also works on uh, the grant. And um, let me see, is that going to, did that run? Did that run for you guys? Aha, uh -huh. are these going to run? Oh, he's an, oh, this one, can you see this one? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, the other two. Let, let, let's let's see if I can get these other two to, to, to run. I'll, I'll go back. Uh, this is this is really the wrinkle structure in close up. And uh, I'm disappointed that it's not working for you there. Um, I, got, you, you, I can send you them down if you if you'd like to see them. This is say, Michael's work. Here's that coffee ring that I was talking about. So that's the edge of that inoculum drop. That little dip there is actually where, where, where the, the experimentalist has dipped the tip of the pipette into the, the agar. And you're just beginning to see this wrinkled structure here develop both inside and outside the coffee ring. This is billions of cells, remember. And uh, you maybe won't see this. This is maybe not going to run for you. Um, but here again, we, what we've done is we've, we've kind of focused down into these wrinkled structures. So this is outside of this coffee ring here, but still we see what looks like it's flat and plain to a uh, kind of eyeball level. If you zoom in, is this incredibly tortuous, complicated structure where again, these are thousands of cells which have collected together to form these sort of twisted ropes. And even at the very, very leading edge of the biofilm, again, we see the complexity of, of, of the structure. So this is the, the very edge. So right at the, right at the very edge where the leading cells are those strings of spaghetti that I was talking about, they fold and twist. And at some distance behind that leading edge, they begin to spin into thicker ropes. They twist around each other and then they form the 3D structure. So really all of these fascinating complex areas of biofilm formation are absolutely open. No, nobody has a clue how these work, how to model them. Uh, if anybody's looking at fascinating uh, problems in, in, in kind of biophysics, I think uh, these movies are a really super starting point. Okay, so that is me. Um, I'd be delighted to uh, address any questions if I can. Uh, I am I'm sorry that the videos didn't show through, but I'd be happy to send those down back to you if um, colleagues are interested. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Thais. It was interesting. So this, this last movies from experiments. Yes, in this, yes, in indeed. Yes, they are experimental yeah. stuff. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. We, we don't, we are, we, we, we are at a loss. I mean, it is mm. so complex, in particular, that that last structure there that we, we saw, um, you know, th this is, this is just a fascinating piece of, of, of movie now that you'll see the kind of grainy whites and blacks there what what they do is they they don't the white is essentially they they um they they, they make a cell glow um using a fluorescent tab but they don't make all cells glow otherwise you just get this kind of blending white light you wouldn't be able to see anything so you make about one in every hundred cells glow and then what we're seeing here is about one in the, the lineage of one in every hundred cells so, so there are lots of cells in between these white strings, but they give the kind of the general view of where the, where the material is going. But you'll see how these ropes form and twist and, and, and they're, they're then coming up out of the plane into the Z direction. So vastly, vastly complicated. Um, so gosh, active matter in there, active turbulence, probably all these kind of physics things that I, I, I know nothing about. Well, it's fluid dynamics models probably. Mm. To apply here. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, guys. It, it is very, very interesting what you told to us. So I just want to check if anyone has questions. Um, Difficult to have a question about a picture <laughs> show sometimes. No, I, I got a question. So when if you get back to this elastic, viscoelastic uh, belayers. Yes. Then, so you you got these structures in in simulations, which are very similar to structures in experiments. So first it was like different scale. That's but, good. Yeah, but it's I mean I'm not about so scale. Probably it's indeed if you 
if you just make it thinner, like same thinner layer elastic and thinner layer viscoelastic, then probably scaling comes, comes back to normal. So I think it's what you did. But what I wanted to ask, can you explain in a couple of sentences why these structures appear? Did you think about this? That's a great question. So um, why does one see, I'll see if I can share the screen just so that we've got the picture um, back up, shall I? These structures here, so why are you seeing these folds and twists? I, okay, so I'm gonna give up, you know, my simple view of this. It, it's, you can imagine it if we were in planar, we would, we would just buckle. So you would get that classic sort of, you know, periodic buckling. And then well, it, it would be good to understand it. So it, it is at the end. So, so this, yeah, th th so this, but this sort of folding, twisting structure seems to be that you then, you know, it's, it is just essentially the combination of, of buckling in this direction and buckling in that direction. And then if you yeah. fold the two together, it seems that, that these are the, the kind, the t very typical patterns that one, one gets. So it looks very convincing. So something like this could happen, if it indeed it happens. The question yeah. is, if it would be any idea to understand how it works. <clears throat> uh, so, well, okay, well other, it is fine. There, there is something to think about. For sure, you know, <laughs> why, why it works other, other than, you know, the, the um, as I say, my, my, my simplistic uh, description there, they're back there, but buckling in, in, in both directions, as it were, simultaneously. And these folding structures because you can do the model and you can set it up so that you you essentially you stretch the biofilm only in one direction and you just get as you imagine the ridges yeah so you get kind of parallel ridges and then if you stretch it in the other direction you get your parallel ridges but if you stretch it in both directions and let go then you get this this kind of tortured buckled structure like that so it's the interaction of the two modes the buckling in, in two directions as it were Maybe you could do some kind of solar automata modeling to analyze mechanisms. Yes, uh, I mean, so it's thinking about the right scale there, isn't it? Because it wouldn't be at this at the cell scale because each one of these ridges is oh gosh, hundreds of cells across. So you know, it, it's it's at the cell. It would have to be at some sort of unit level, I think. Um, you know, and, and so people like um, John Ward in um it, it, at loughborough there you know they, john's done some nice um some nice cellular automata work where he thinks about uh, elements of the biofilm not as being individual cells but you know, maybe a hundred cells or something like yeah, that with yeah, the associated okay. bio uh, biomass <clears throat> so he he's he is he has you know, there is there are ways of kind of getting to that middle scale through individual based models, but they are difficult. Okay, and one more question. So if we go to a wave of self starvation slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, at some point when uh, this uh, biofilm stop growing, yeah? And yes. is it associated, so it's understood, it's because it's something produced, some kind of exit, and this exit binds iron. Yes. It is fine, but if we talk about this areas, I mean, what is key point? What is the limiting point, sir? Is it the rate of production of this uh, exit or its rate of binding to iron? So. If, if to put it different way, I would say when it stops, when it stops this biofilm, when it gets to certain size or when it comes to certain time? That's a great question. So uh, it, it is, it is um, because we, we thought hard about this, about it, is it a maturation process? That is, do, does the, is there an internal clock within the biofilm, which in some sense says, right, I'm this old, and therefore I will stop growing? Or is it a, a size or, um, you know, kind of time, um, a different time factor? But, but it, what we showed is it's not a, a maturation thing. So it is definitely not a case that the biofilm just thinks it's that old and therefore stops growing. So where the limiting, um, uh, where the limiting factor is is in the rate 
at which the exuded material, so this pulchinaminic acid, can collate the iron. Okay, so yeah. this iron binding is uh, the is the key thing, yes, process, because yeah. what you can do is you can in fact genetically modify the bugs so that they can super express this material. So you can get them to make lots of this and they don't seem to slow down any faster. So you, you know, so we, we, we check that, we check to see that if, if the, 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 the biofilm can produce this pulchinaminic acid at, a, at its maximum rate, if you like, you know, or, or super maximum rate, you can get it to overexpress it, then it doesn't slow down any quicker. So it seems to be the binding rate that, that is the, uh, the um, limiting factor. And then what you can do is you can imagine the next experiment is you can add more or less iron to the, the, the agar. And then, then you do see that you can, if you're adding more iron, then in fact, you can, you can get the biofilm to grow for a bit further. So it's that, it's that careful balance between iron availability and, and the, the well, as I understood, you model this. If you model this, you could just check this, this uh, constants. Sure. So, yeah. so, so absolutely. So, so the idea was that we, we checked, checked with the model and then we, we, um, well, we built hypothesis with the model and then we were able to check with the experiment. So then we, we developed assays that then changed the level of iron in the environment. We, we developed assays which then mutated the biofilm so it could produce more or less of this pulchinaminic acid. Okay, great. Thanks, Thais. Any more questions? Anyone? Hi, I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, okay. Nice, nice talk first. Thanks. In fact, I had two. I had a, one originally about uh, your interspecies interactions, but just you when you were talking about the the sort of limiting factor and the overexpression of that that iron connector uh, or whatever it was. Yes. How the fact that so if I understand it right, you said that you can upregulate the thingamy acid, whatever it yes, was called. Yes, pul pulcheraminic acid. Yeah, yeah and you, you can't get any bigger. So I wondered how that related to your, your hypothesis about it being a kind of a moat and a, a, a sort of um, a way of protecting against, against competitors if you, can't, if you can't get bigger anyway, kind of thing, if that makes sense. Sure. Versus, you know, is it actually just that, that that ring, that limit is a physical limitation? It's not an adaptation, it's just you can't get any bigger kind of thing it, it could it could well be cut i mean that you know we, we were speculating as to why we you know why would why would the why would an organism that requires iron release a substance that collates iron in its local environment so yes. so that 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 was the fundamental question you know that, that if i need iron why do i make a substance that may, makes it harder for me to get iron uh, I see, I think I had misunderstood that because yeah, yeah. so, so, iron collation so, would help, you know, that helps no, with the uptake so, because... Yeah, you, no, the, yeah, the, the, as far as I understand it, collation means that it changes it to an iron... Oh gosh, chemistry, help me out, something, salt, whatever, um, changes to something else <laughs> that the, the, the cell cannot absorb as, as, as free iron. But yes, it's not like a siderophore or something that's helping it. Uh, no, it's the, it's yep. the opposite. No, I had yeah. I misunderstood that part. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I beg your pardon, I didn't make that clear. So, so it's this weird thing where, where, where it's, it seems to be perverse. It seems to be that the bug is trying to make it harder for itself to grow. So why, why on earth would it do this? Have you so, tried any like competition experiments to see whether there is an advantage if you're in competition? something that, that can't produce that yes yes indeed that 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 that's the case and and there's a couple a couple of nice images in in the paper there uh, where where colleagues have grown ex done exactly that experiment where you you grow um bugs that can that can produce this pulchinaminic acid against ones that can't and and, and the the ones that that can't get get overrun so they don't have this boundary they don't have this moat around them so they do get overrun, they do get invaded. So it does seem to be, um, you know, of course, just a few examples that, that have been shown, that it does afford some competitive advantage or protective advantage anyway, to be able to build this. So it seems to be some sort of trade-off at, at a very, very high level, you know, that, uh, that is that whether it exactly works, because this, this, this biofilm assay in the lab is a very, um, 
crude assay and, and, and you know, not typical of where these bacteria normally grow, which is in complex environments like the soil. <clears throat> but essentially, locally, what we're seeing is that the bug is producing something which stops itself growing. And the only sort of sensible view we could say is why does, why does the bug spend energy in producing this stuff? Um, it must be in some sense to, 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 to just tip the balance so it can grow enough, but it doesn't get invaded by others. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, kind of almost spiteful, I guess. But yeah, that, that brings me to my second question, which was just where are you going with the, the multi-species biofilm stuff? And are you, are you thinking about other interactions as well? Yeah, so um, where, we, where we're going here um, is looking at um, two things. So <clears throat> first off is looking at um, a single strain uh, biofilms where you, you simply um, are looking at structures where you have self, um, or only, only self, and then working out exactly where, do, where does, you know, where does, if I put a purple cell right in the middle, where does it grow? And why does it grow there? Um, so we did that initially. Then we looked at taking two strains, uh, different strains, and growing them together in biofilms. Um, where one strain would otherwise outcompete the other. So if you grew two in a flask, then one would grow more quickly than the other. If you grew two on a plate, kind of on top of each other, it would appear that one would kill the other, or at least would inhibit its growth. So you definitely got a com competitive pairing. So we're looking at competitive pairings within single biofilms, and then what, what is it that determines the competitive outcome? And what we've been able to show, just to summarize, is that it's this race for space. So what we've been able to show is that for low founder densities, in any case, just for low founder densities, then it is not important if you're the strong guy or the weak guy. It's actually more important is where do I get to run to? So the weak competitor, if, it, if the weak competitor's got space to run to, it can in fact dominate the eventual footprint of the biofilm. So that's, that's where we got to with this bit. Then what Lucas has been working on and, and is just in fact, just last week submitted to Oikos is um, the question is, well, all of this is done in homogeneous environments. So all of this is done basically in math model experiments, all done on homogeneous agars, basically. Completely uniform in their nutrients and their structure. What would happen if, if we were thinking about this in a heterogeneous environment? So one in which perhaps one of the species could grow, uh, the species grow faster or slower depending on where they are in, in, in the environment. Getting closer, closer, not, not accurately, but getting closer to what um, bacteria might uh, encounter in, in the wild. So how does heterogeneity then affect this outcome? And in fact, what, what Lucas has been able to show is that um, heterogeneity in the environment has an effect on, on the total areas that, that, that the biofilm reaches, that gets to the footprint area, but it's still in fact this race for space which dominates. So even in the case where our environment is very heterogeneous, it's still the case where what we can do is if you can tell me where your cells are to start, then we can tell you what the outcome is. I'm being deliberately vague there because, as you see, they're still there. But you can look at the bio archive, um, the bio archive copies for some further details. Oh, that's interesting. So I guess seeing that they don't just segregate into their own separate niches, then. So the the you know if you imagine it, this purple guy is weak. Yeah. So it, along this edge where the purple and the green meet, the purple the green basically kills the purple and invades into the purple. However, the purple has got all of this access to, to, to essentially free space. So the purple can continue to grow out along this outer edge. So if you took the green and your purple and you put them in a flask or you put them in a lock of Volterra or ordinary differential equation, are you a mathematician, Kat? Are uh, you? I hover on the boundary of, of maths and biology. Yeah, okay, but yeah. I know Lotka Volterra models very well. So, you know, you put them together in a Lotka Volterra model, and Lotka Volterra would tell you that green wins. Yeah, put them together in a flask, and, and, and the outcome would be that green wins. Put them together on a, in a spatially extended system, 
And in fact, you can you, you can have situations where purple wins. So it's this wonderful kind of uh, demonstration that, that 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 by extending it by by allowing the, the the species to grow in space as well in as time, you can in fact evolve population balances which are totally different from what you would expect from your you know your Locke Volterra or your shaped flask experiment. So a wonderful sort of flipping of the head of that competitive exclusion principle. That's nice. I like that sort of stuff. It's interesting. Oh, yeah, it's dead cool, Thanks. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Lu Lucas is brilliant. So please, please do look out for him. I have a question. I want to know why you made a choice to work with um, Bisoptilis. Um, do you expect the same thing to occur if you like choose um, make the choice of choosing another sub of bacteria like um, Pseudomonas to work with, which you expect yeah. not to grow this type of biofilm, um, as you see, because this type of biofilm is peculiar to this of Do you expect something to be happening in that sort of um, the biofilm of, like, say, Pseudomonas or anything? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm, if I may, I'm going to show you just one one last slide. Can, can you? Um, can you see my mm -hmm. my my picture there? Yeah. So Emmanuel, these are these are biofilms of of, of many different species of, of bacterium, and in fact, this this middle one isn't a bacterium at all. This middle one is um, this one here um, is this it's on the right hand column, second up is in fact a yeast. So so these this shows you that that structure that biofilm structure is really not restricted to the to choice of, of bacterium. Why we chose Bacillus subtilis is, is the serendipitous situation that my colleague Nicola is a Bacillus subtilis expert. Bacillus subtilis is a, you know is relevant from an industrial perspective, uh, but it is also a very well known lab organism. So it grows well. People understand how it works and why it works. So we chose it as a kind of you know, model biological organism, but the output that we got from it is, is, is replicated across a different bacteria and in fact different species. So yeasts are, are, are little uh, single cell um, fungi, uh, which are closer to us than they are to bacteria. They, they've got nucleus and everything. So and even in those little microbes that you get these structured biofilms. So, I think it's a good point that why did we choose bacillus? But um, the, otherwise, it, it, I think all of our conclusions are are, are broadly applicable across biofilms. Thanks, Thais. Uh, more questions? Sure. Okay, so, yeah. So just real, real quick question. Um, yeah. So um, initially you found that the patterns you're seeing were in the wrong uh, scale because you, of the assumption that the agar was viscoelastic, right? And then making it uh, more rigid gave you the correct scale. But have you looked at it the other way? So if you have a more viscoelastic agar experimentally, um, d uh, does the pattern spread further? Uh, so what happens, that, that's a great question. In fact, we, what happens experimentally <clears throat> is we showed that if we make the medium more, or uh, sorry, le less uh, or more, uh, no, less viscous, so more slippy, um, okay. then, then in fact what happens is the pattern goes away. So experimentally we can certainly verify that. And, and, in, and indeed that one, one can do that in the model. So you make the you make it less viscous, you make it more fluid, and uh, it it the pattern goes away. So so that that's a that's a really good point about how it controls the roughness. So that viscoelastic property. Now remember that that what we said was to get the right scales, we actually had to think about the biofilm itself being the viscoelastic layer. But clearly, it does interact with the the underlying substratum as well. So, so essentially that, you know, the, there's a lot more complex physics going on than we were able to, to uncover, that's for sure. But experimentally, we can definitely say that changing the agar, the underlying viscous material, changing its properties has a distinct and profound effect on the roughness, on the size of, of these wrinkles. Thank you. Good, thanks. More questions? Probably sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a second question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when you were looking at the mechanism um, that is causing um, 
changes in the in the um, the structure and everything. Why did you look at iron and um, the acid, the acid code? What 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 made you think in that direction in the first place? So that that's that's a good question. Is that's a great question, man? So so what what you're saying is why? So we had this situation where the <clears throat> the wild tide stops, and I guess you know it's but all interdisciplinary science is a bit of coming backwards and forwards. So what we is, is we, that our, my colleagues in the lab, they would grow these biofilms in a certain kind of agar and they would notice this, this, this brown halo. And this brown halo, I don't know if you can see it in your slides, but it's, it's mm -hmm. ever so slightly darker brown than the, than the surrounding um, medium. And they knew that this was, in fact, this, this chelated iron, this, this, this salt of iron, this, this um, iron compound. And so, you know, they didn't, they didn't know whether the, the existence of this iron compound stopped growth, but it certainly seemed to be consistent with growth arrest. That is, if you mutated, um, the biofilm, so it didn't stop growing, then you didn't have this brown halo. So what the experimentalists were able to say is growth stops, brown halo is there, growth continues, no brown halo. And what we were, what we were able to do in the Mac thing was then to say, okay, well, what is the connection here then? What is the connection, the mechanistic connection between this brown halo and growth? And I suppose that's what we were able to offer. Uh, with the math modeling. So we didn't, you know, I didn't, didn't kind of, as with all of these things, it was a bit of, well, we've got an observation, we're not quite sure what it means, we're not quite sure with these two things, how they connect. Math modeling comes in, suggests how they may connect, and then we go back and check that hypothesis in the lab. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Dave. Thank you.